All right. I hope I, I've shared my, my screen all right here. Um, yep. Just want to get us started off uh, with a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, my name is Andrea Coronado. I'm with Tip of the Mid Watershed Council, and I'll be facilitating today's Icebreaker Speaker Series. Um, thank you for joining us. We'll be hosting this series every other Thursday at noon, January through March. Uh, and this icebreaker series is free to our community. Thanks to our generous members and donors. And I'm sure many of you are in the audience today. Thank you so much uh, for your kind support. For those of you who are new to the Watershed Council, excuse me, uh, we are an environmental nonprofit celebrating 45 years this year of protecting and caring for our water resources in Northern Michigan. And with the help of many like Todd, who we have here joining us today, uh, we work to preserve the truly irreplaceable lakes, rivers, streams, and waters that make our home in Northern Michigan so unique. We work locally, excuse me, I click across here. Uh, we work locally in watersheds within Antrim, Charlevoix, Sheboygan, and Emmett counties and through the Great Lakes Basin. Um, so just a, a quick little bit of housekeeping um, today. We will have all attendees muted during the program to avoid any background noises. So if you have a question, um, we'll ask you to please place that in the Q&A function at the bottom of your, your screen there. Um, not the chat function, it's the Q&A function. We will answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, we have about 150 registrations um, joining or registrants joining us today. So when we get to that Q&A portion of the program, we may have to limit questions to keep our presentation to an hour. And if we don't get to your questions um, due to time constraints, we will follow up with you individually or you're always welcome to contact us at the Watershed Council. You can find us all, um, message us all directly from the website. Uh, there will be a brief survey at the end of the presentation, and we truly would appreciate your feedback. It helps us to improve these uh, lectures every year. And as always, uh, virtual technology can always go wrong. Um, so if you experience any technical difficulties during this presentation, we, we really do appreciate your patience as we work out any glitches. So I am thrilled to introduce our presenter today. Todd Losey is president of Nice Wander Environmental LLC. Todd is a certified professional wetland scientist, instructor, and natural resource consultant, currently serving as president of Nice Wander Environmental and the Michigan Wetlands Association. Todd has managed various natural resource projects, specializing in wetland restoration and mitigation, and spent 15 years as a specialist with the Michigan Department of Environment, Environment Great Lakes, and Energy, known as EGLE. Um, overseeing wetland, lake, and stream regulations. I'm going to turn it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you, Todd. Thank you so much for joining us. Great, thank you. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So I want everybody to read this. I'll give you 15 seconds. This is the first paragraph of Justice Alito's majority opinion in Sackett v. EPA, which goes on to nearly eliminate the valid validity of the Clean Water Act. So he initially recognizes the importance of it. And then we'll get into what they did after that. Uh, welcome and thank you for having me. I'm excited to be presenting uh, in the icebreaker series for the Tip and Met Watershed Council. Through my, throughout my career, the Watershed Council has been integral in maintaining Michigan's wetlands. Water protection laws, as I have seen firsthand, they are a force in protecting and preserving Michigan's water resources. Without the Watershed Council, my discussion today about Michigan's wetland protection regulations would look a lot different, for sure. So I wanna start with what is a wetland? And then we'll get into the state and federal regulations, and then we'll get into the Sackett decision. But I wanted to go through uh, the first five or 10 slides about why are we here? What are we talking about? So some wetlands are easy to recognize. Most of you guys are going to see like a cattail marsh on a lake, um, a tidal marsh in coastal Connecticut there, or a bald cypress swamp in, in southeast in the bottom right-hand corner. Nobody's arguing those are wetlands, but it gets a lot more controversial when you get into these wetlands that are seasonally flooded. 
Um, during the wet season, hydrology is obvious, but for much of the year, uh, any surface water is either lacking or under the ground surface. This gets challenging for people to identify and becomes quite controversial when activities are proposed in these areas. So when we look at wetland identification, we do uh, wetland delineation. So we have to delineate the wetland boundary. And that is a, identified through the use of three criteria, the presence of hydrophytic vegetation, hydric soils, and wetland hydrology. Some or, may, or all may be present at any given time throughout the year. The boundary is where those three typically overlap. There are some instances where you may have two or in, in some cases, one of those criteria. But for the most part on uh, how you delineate wetlands, wetland boundaries and identify wetland areas, it's by the this three criteria approach outlined in the, the Army Corps 87 manual and the regional supplements. So as we delineate wetlands, uh, we have to identify exactly where the wetlands are. This is a typical delineation map. This helps us determine the limits of potential state and federal regulation. Um, it aids in land management decisions, and it determines if you need uh, permits or authorizations, and can those be avoided by potentially avoiding the wetlands uh, through uh, feasible and prudent alternative analysis. Approximately 17% of Michigan is wetland. And that has a huge diversity, as you guys are aware, of wetland types, from their vegetated lake plain prairies in the southeast to our cedar swamps in the north, uh, our muskegs, our black spruce swamps, bogs. Um, we've also got farm dwellings, and we've got wetland ponds and lakes. So overall, the 17% that is remaining is approximately 50% of what was on the landscape in Michigan prior to European settlement. So we've drained about 50% since European settlement. Here's, if we look at the entire United States, here's kind of how the wetland loss breaks out. And it, overall, it's about 50% loss in the United States, uh, the same as Michigan. That's also true for Western Europe. They've lost about 50% of their wetlands as well. So a uh, pretty common human settlement comes in and we drain and modify wetland areas uh, for settlement purposes, agriculture, development, uh, water management, all those things. If we look at Michigan a little closer, uh, by county, we can start to see where the where we've got the most significant losses. And as you would assume, we have the most losses of wetland in the south southern lower peninsula, with really high losses uh, in the Lake Plain areas along the eastern coast of, of Michigan and those those eastern Lake Plain counties and up into Saginaw Bay where we're looking at 80 to 90 percent loss of wetlands. So getting into policy a little more, the history of Michigan and, and our water protection in terms of the regulations regarding wetlands really started in 1972 where we have the Michigan Inland Lakes and Streams Act was passed, now referred to as Part 301. Uh, the Clean Water Act, the Federal Clean Water Act was passed in 1972 as well at the same time as the environmental movement was taking off. In 1977, the Federal Clean Water Act was amended to allow state administration of the Section 404 program, which is commonly referred to as the um, dredge and fill program relating to wetland regulations. With that in place, the state of Michigan passed Part 303, or, or at that time, the Michigan Wetland Protection Act, which was called the Gomer Anderson um, Act, and Part 3, which is now referred to Part 303, that was passed with the intention of assuming the Section 404 federal regulation. So once that federal regulation passed in 77, the, the state legislature and the natural resource agencies uh, wrote a statute to assume that federal authority. Very unusual, and Michigan was the first state to do this. Over the next four years, the state and EPA negotiated a memorandum of, of agreement on how Michigan was going to implement that Section 404 authority. And that, that was signed in 83, and then they went 
I also negotiated with the Army Corps, who has joint jurisdiction with the EPA in 1984. So in 1984, Michigan took over the Section 404 program. What that means is that Michigan does the state and federal permitting for most coastal or mo most areas in Michigan except the coasts. Uh, under the Section 404 program regulations, the Army Corps maintained jurisdiction of the coastal waters uh, for navigation purposes, basically where uh, areas of significant uh, traditional navigable waters, so the Great Lakes and connecting channels. So if you are in those areas, you're familiar that you need both a core permit and a state of Michigan permit. If you're outside of the coastal areas, the areas shown in red on this map, you can go to the, the department, the, to EGLE, Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, and get a permit that will carry with it the federal permitting authority. So it's worked really well. It's uh, minimizes time and effort for applicants. In most other states, you would be required to get uh, a state and federal permit if the state has uh, a water protection regulatory authority. So the only other states with Section 404 authority currently is New Jersey, which carries full authority similar to Michigan, and Florida has a partial, partial authority of Section 404 which is relatively new. And they're, they're working through that process uh, as we speak. So of note and of particular importance as we move forward in this presentation is uh, why do we have these statutes? Well, the legislature, when they passed the Wetland Protection Act in 1979, they wrote in there specifically why wetlands were important to the people of the state of Michigan. And um, I'll just, briefly cover this as they stated that as a matter of state concern, since one, a wetland of one county may be affected by acts on a river, lake, stream, or wetland of other counties, we need to protect them. They also can deprive the people, the loss of wetland may deprive the people of things like flood or storm control, wildlife habitat, protection of subsurface water resources, pollution treatment, erosion control, sources of nutrients, uh, co clearly covering a vast array of functions and values and really impressive uh, knowing that this was passed in 1979. So a long time ago, and we have continued to uh, have further scientific research to document all the importance, or importance of each of these functions and values of the wetland. Um, and, and I'm not sure any are more important than others, but as we have seen with, with climate change, flood and storm control, uh, hugely important for wetlands. And as we remove wetlands from the landscape, we see significant increases in flood and storm damages. So maintaining those in our watersheds for, the, for just that purpose alone is very important. So here's a slide of just the landscape. I just wanted to show this to show kind of the array of protections that the state of Michigan has throughout the landscape and, and the protection of our natural resources. So the most critical one we're talking about today is part 303, the wetland protection. It's going to protect uh, wetlands on, on inland lakes, it's going to protect isolated wetlands of certain sizes, uh, and it's going to protect coastal wetlands on the Great Lakes. And as we work through, there's a lot of interaction with other statutes, specific, specifically part 301. And as you can see here, 301 overlaps with lakes, rivers, drains, and intermittent streams. And where 301 and 303 uh, specifically overlap is not that important. Uh, we don't typically draw a line between part 301 regulation and part 303 regulation. We don't delineate the wetlands in the water. And that will become more important as we talk about the federal law and, and what the Supreme Court has uh, proposed that we look at in, in the future. But in Michigan, we've got these overlapping statutes that we don't need to do that. Um, and intermittent streams are, are important as well, regulated under part 301, if they actually have defined beds and banks. If they have vegetation in them, they're typically uh, regulated under part 303. So you've got 
um, to make that decision. It doesn't really matter. The statutes more or less work the same, same type of um, permit review process and same type of protections. So as we look at wetland regulations in Michigan, we've got our definition above, basically identifying those three criteria that I talked about earlier. Wetlands have predominance of vegetation, hydric soils, and inundation or saturation of water. So you have hydrology. So that is laid out in the statute. That's the basis for the delineation procedures that I talked about earlier. But where Michigan really jumps ahead of everybody, and I really think everybody in terms of states, is our ability and, and our definition of what is a regulated wetland or regulated water. And so it's, it's simplified here a bit in this box, but it tells the story. Wetlands are regulated if they're connected to other waters. So think about if you could dump a pollutant into a wetland and that wetland could flow downstream into another public water, that wetland is regulated because that wetland is serving a purpose to protect that public water. Uh, wetlands within 500 feet of inland lakes or streams or a thousand feet of the Great Lakes. Uh, those are important for, again, flood control, for sure, if they're along a river. Uh, they're also important because they're typically connected via subsurface water flow. And so impacting those wetlands can have a detrimental effect on those other waters, on our in the lakes and streams and, and, and the Great Lakes. Wetlands that are more than five acres in size. So this one's reaching out there a little bit. The wetlands that are, are large are important for, for the public and this the legislature recognizes that by protecting five acre wetlands, even if they're not connected to another water body. Uh, have state or federal threatened species or are rare and imperiled wetlands. And then waters of the US, WOTUS, I'm gonna talk about that in a bit. So WOTUS under the Federal Clean Water Act, if it is a, a water of the US wetland, then it's gonna be regulated by the state of Michigan as well. And that helps us maintain our federal permitting authority then the definition of that, we're gonna spend a lot of time on. So again, here's our, our wetland loss from 1978 to 2005. We've really slowed down the loss. So European settlement, settlement to 1977, we lost 4.2 million acres of wetland. And I showed you that earlier where that was located. We've continued to lose even after 78 when we passed the statute, uh, we continue to lose some wetlands. But that number's, um, at least from 98 to 2005, roughly 1,200 acres a year. Um, and on average, about 1,500 acres of wetland loss per year since the passage of the Wetland Protection Statute. So really, it dropped off a cliff in terms of wetland impact. The, the statute worked to protect wetland areas. I don't think anybody could argue that. As we get into the Federal Clean Water Act, uh, the stated objective of the Federal Clean Water Act is to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. And this is important. We need to think about this and remember this as we move forward. The Federal Clean Water Act is to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. And here's the WOTUS term again, waters of the U.S., which are waters regulated by the federal government under clean water. So I'll talk a lot about WOTUS. That's really what the presentation is about. And uh, so those are the waters regulated by the federal government. So I like this quote. This is from um, Kagan's concurring judgment in Sackett versus EPA. Um, Justice Kagan concurred with the, uh, the determination that the Sackett property was not regulated but she dissented on the overall reach of the Clean Water Act, which we're gonna talk about. But again, similar to my first slide, Justice Alito is saying the, the Clean Water Act has worked. Uh, if, you've, if you've been in the water, it's cleaner than it was in, in 1972 when they passed the Clean Water Act. If you're eating fish out of lakes and streams, they're cleaner than they were for the most part uh, in 1972. So it, it, the, the Clean Water Act has been extremely successful. This is a map of 
the wetlands in the United States, and you can see they're they're pretty um, they're located in certain areas on the southeast coast of the United States, the Midwest, the northern Midwest. Um, note the prairie pothole region. This this gets pretty important with this decision. This is heavily uh, it's significant for waterfowl breeding and migration. Uh, this is where we have a high density of small wetland uh, systems, which would be for the most part called isolated wetlands now. Uh, you've got over 50% of Alaska is wetlands. And then you just have scattered wetlands throughout. So you can see that some states would be more interested in wetland protection than others. Michigan's right there in the middle, raking about 10th or 11th in wetland acreage in the country. <clears throat> so let's break down the, the history of the, the Supreme Court. What is a water and what is the reach of the Federal Clean Water Act has been going through the courts for many years. Um, and specifically the reach of that 1977 Section 404. Um, what, what, are, what is the regulation of the wetlands under the Clean Water Act? In 1985, uh, United States versus Riverside Bayview, the court ruled unanimously the government has the power to control intrastate wetlands as water of the U.S. Interesting enough, all of these cases I'm going to talk about are from the Midwest. The Riverside Bayview is, is a property located in Harrison Township in Macomb County, uh, Michigan. So even though we had 404 authority, uh, this, this was a coastal area that the Corps and EPA maintained authority over as well. And, and went to court over. In nine to zero, you do not see that every day in the Supreme Court nowadays, but they ruled that uh, the, the Army Corps does have ability to regulate adjacent wetlands that are intrastate wetlands. So that was good. It was going pretty well until 2001 in the Swank decision, the Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County in Illinois uh, versus the Army Corps. The court divided five to four, found that the migratory bird rule utilized by the Army Corps for Clean Water Act authority was not valid. What that rule was, was that the Army Corps and EPA under Section 404 was saying that the use of isolated ponds, basically isolated water bodies that by migratory birds, was a reg was a, the ability to regulate those waters, and the court came back and said that is not a reasonable use of um, of the Clean Water Act authority, and deemed that these ponds um, or isolated wetlands were no longer uh, waters of the U.S. So pretty big change. It was a pretty big surprise to everybody, um, but it went. It, it was it was still doable. It's still Clean Water Act and the EPA and the Corps maintained authority over, over the majority of wetlands throughout the country. And then came along the Rapanos decision in 2006. A highly divided court and a 4-1-4 plurality decision uh, ruled that the Clean Water Act authority, must there must be a significant nexus to navigable waters for water to be covered under WOTUS. Um, but the significant nexus wasn't well defined and remained open for judicial interpretation and considerable controversy. So when this decision was written, it was it was known that it would be back at the Supreme Court. Note that the the four one four the four um, conservative justices stated that the court or the Clean Water Act should only regulate basically navigable. Water. Um, it actually didn't go as far as, as what we're going to talk about in a minute in the Sackett decision, but it went, went pretty far to limiting the, the scope of the Clean Water Act. Uh, but the most important one is the one there. That's Justice Kennedy, and that's where he defined the significant nexus. So whenever a five majority could be reached between the three different decisions, that was the, the law of the land. And significant nexus came about, and 
we then went into the post Rapanos world, which has been crazy. A change with, with every president, as we had post Rapanos guidance from President Bush, we had the 2015 rule, clean water rule from Obama, which, which reached pretty far with a lot of science behind it, a lot of research on the importance of the connectivity of the, the waters of the U.S. and why the Clean Water Act needed to reach up into uh, these higher watershed areas to protect the, the navigable waters downstream. Um, that that went, then was changed by President Trump through the 2020 navigable water protection rules, where he went back to more of um, the Scalia decision in the Rapanos, where the, it was reduced the Clean Water Act reach uh, to navigable waters. But again, not as far as they went with Sackett. They went quite a bit further than what the, the Trump rule was uh, going to talk about. And then we had the pre sackett Biden rule, which basically went back to the 2015 Clean Water Rule. Again, more research, more science on the importance of this connectivity of the waters of the U.S. And then Sackett comes out in 2023. Um, so Sackett v. EPA, the court unanimously reversed the Ninth Circuit, basically unanimously said that the Sackett property was not regulated. But it split on the rationale, and it split, and that rationale included the reach of the Clean Water Act. So note that Sackett focused on wetlands, but the decision affects jurisdictional status of all types of waters, and we will talk about that a little bit more. That's where it gets a pretty pretty scary. Um, they stated that a relatively permanent stream or other body of water connected to interstate net traditionally navigable waters is considered a water of the U.S. So a river that flows most, if not all the time, that can be followed all the way to an interstate, traditionally navigable water is considered WOTUS. So for relatively permanent waters in Michigan, if you can follow the water continuously to the Great Lakes, for instance, uh, that's gonna be a regulated water body. That of course gets tougher. In Michigan, it's easy. We've got the Great Lakes all around us. Those are all traditionally navigable waters. When you get into other states, that can be quite a bit more challenging. Um, wetlands that are waters of the U.S. or wetlands are waters of the U.S. if they're indistinguishable from uh, from waters of the U.S., which is which they are adjacent or have a continuous surface water connection. That's challenging for wetlands. Most wetlands are seasonal, so they flood in the spring and they dry out throughout the, the year, especially in the Midwest. And so how that continuous surface water connection will be applied is we're still waiting to see how EPA and CORE try to interpret that and how they these areas are also indistinguishable from the permanent water areas of say the Great Lakes. Um, I, I think it really restricts and challenges uh, where, we're, where we're at there. <clears throat> And then the significant nexus test basically was thrown out. That was it is no longer valid. So it was valid for from 2006 in the Rapanos decision to 2023. It's been the focus of the federal regulatory authority since that time, and now it's gone. It's just that simple. Um, what it seems like in the SACA decision is that the court appears to just have ignored the reason for the Clean Water Act and the stated purpose of the Clean Water Act to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. Uh, the decision was really more based on states' rights, uh, stating that the states will protect their waters. Uh, the problem is that most states have relied on the Clean Water Act to do this since 1972. So most states are not prepared to take this take on this responsibility, at least immediately, as they've been forced to really look at, and, and some are trying to do that. But that was the, it's not about the purpose of the statute. It was more about the state's, the state's rights and the court's believe, belief that the federal government shouldn't regulate waters, uh, that that is a state right and a state responsibility. One interesting thing is um, Justice Kavanaugh looked at, looked at the, disconnection. So the majority decision in Sackett found that artificial barriers, such as dikes, levees, berms, 
break the wetland and they aren't that would they would no longer be indistinguishable from the navigable water if there was say a berm in the way and so this is really <laughs> at least in the 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 conservative side uh, the only time in all of the opinions that they talked about science so this uh, i've bolded there the scientific evidence overwhelmingly demonstrates that wetlands separated by covered waters by those kinds of berms or barriers for our example, still play an important role in protecting neighboring and downstream waters, including filtering pollutants, storing water, and providing flood control. So he recognized the importance of it and, and recognized that the statement that a berm should break a wetland is really not legitimate. And, and it has never been legitimate. And the implementation of the, the Federal Clean Water Act, as well as Michigan statutes, clearly state that artificial barriers don't break wetlands. And I did want to show an example of that. So this is... Uh, wetland complex west of St. Ignace. This is Lake Michigan, and this is a dune swale complex, huge wetland uh, on the north side of Lake Michigan. What the decision says is this wetland is now broken by this road, even though there may be culverts or other connections. This, my reading of the statute at least, and again, we're waiting for EPA and CORE to come out with guidance on this, but the, the clear reading and, and the reading the way Kavanaugh read the decision this area is no longer considered a waters of the U.S. and connected. And clearly that road, at least on this air photo, is having very little impact on the uh, ecology of the sweatland. We're not seeing any type of change of vegetation, change of, of water movement or backing up of water. Uh, this, is, this is a significant concern for the protection of these, these Great Lake coastal wetlands. And, and in Michigan, those, those, these would be regulated by the state still, but in other states, they may not be. So that's a significant concern as we look at the quality of the Great Lakes. So Earth Justice estimates that over 59 million acres of wetlands are threatened by the Sackett ruling. So a pretty large number. I think it's a significant underestimate. Uh, I don't know that the Sackett, the, the, Implementation of the Sackett ruling will regulate many wetlands outside of the navigable, navigable water channels. I think it's going to be very challenging for EPA and CORE. And of course, everything will be uh, continue to be debated in court. So what did the Sackett not change? So Sackett did not change the federal procedure for identifying wetlands. Like I talked about, we're still working under a three criteria approach. The 87 manual and regional supplements are still in place. Uh, we're still delineating wetlands, and a, a, according to EPA and CORE, delineations of properties need to be done. The wetlands need to be identified as part of a development project, and that would result in the CORE doing a jurisdictional determination to determine if those wetlands that are delineated are regulated or not. Um, and I, I'm afraid that a lot of those that previously would have been regulated by the Clean Water Act would not anymore. So, so Sackett focused on the geographic scope of the Clean Water Act and did not address regulated activities under the Clean Water Act, such as what is a discharge. Stay tuned for that. More to come. Federal, the, the Supreme Court's looking at a, a few cases to take on uh, the discharge and what is a discharge and what, what waters would be regulated under the discharge. This would be things like corporate pollution. Uh, what, what Does the federal government have authority even over that? Um, or is that going to be the, the individual states will have to take that on in, independently? The feeling is, based on the Sackett decision and other things we're seeing out of the Supreme Court, is that that will be pushed back to the states as well, which would be a major change in environmental protection. Um, so Sackett did not change the states and tribes authority under the Clean Water Act to be more environmentally protected than the federal program. So that's good. So that, that allows that the states still can regulate wetlands and regulate their waters if they, if they so choose. So what happened after Sackett? And these are just some um, art news articles that pulled off Google. But what you'll see is the states are, are, challenge, are challenged with it. So there's chaos. Um, New Mexico jumped at it and said, we got to get a program. And so they're looking for money. They're, they're trying to set up a program. Well, that's not quick. You know, government's not quick. They're looking to get some money, hire some people, get the regulations in place. As, and, and they're not the only state trying to do that. So we have seen some states step up for sure. We've also seen some states go backwards. Uh, North Carolina immediately passed a law that said 
uh, the state of North Carolina cannot regulate wa any waters not covered by the Clean Water Act. So they reduced the regulation significantly based on Sackett. So IDEM, uh, Indiana, California, Colorado, Tennessee, uh, everybody is struggling. So Clean Water Act curtails Clean Water Act. What is actually protected? We don't know. States can step up and, and hopefully do something as the federal government tries to figure this out. And, and a lot of these issues continue in the courts. In Michigan, at least Eagle's position is uh, we're good. Michigan law shields wetlands from Supreme Court decision. And I think that's true. Uh, Michigan wetlands protected dis despite the Scottish ruling. Wetland regulation stable in Michigan despite Supreme Court ruling. A lot of questions. Eagle's got a lot of phone calls. I, as a private consultant, have gotten a lot of phone calls regarding uh, the Supreme Court decision and people thinking that it impacts uh, wetlands in Michigan. It does not change this, the state law. So I, I stole this slide directly from an Eagle presentation. Uh, so that this is Eagle's position on the Sackett ruling. So Michigan operates under state law. So wetlands and streams are regulated and not affected by the Sackett ruling. The regulations in Michigan stay the same. Big, big thing that we have have the 404 program. So we it's really insulated Michigan by having these these statutes in place. Um, the ruling as well as instability and lack of regulatory clarity at the federal level over the last decade reinforces the importance of having a comprehensive and stable state program. And it's been true since 2001, since the Swank decision. Uh, we have really not felt uh, the angst that other states have felt in figuring out what's regulated, what's not regulated, what can be developed, what can't be developed, what you know, what, what needs permits, what doesn't, all that stuff the other states are dealing with. Michigan really hasn't hasn't felt that. So having these programs and having these strong programs have been important. So the second decision, though, does impact how waters are regulated in the Great Lake Basin and will likely have long-term impacts throughout the region and on the Great Lake especially as there's gaps on those other, the other states have significant gaps that they've relied on the federal government to, to regulate these waters that are, may not, not be regulated anymore. So Michigan's program has operated since for over 40 years, in part because of strong partnership between the state and federal agencies and strong federal protection. That's key. Uh, we have relied on that strong federal protection to maintain our statute and our, our law in Michigan. So again, this clarity. So they, the Supreme Court, the EPA, the core, the different administrations are all fighting over what needs, what's regulated on the federal level in terms of what. In Michigan, again, it's clear. Here it is. Somebody asks, here it is. And it makes it simple and it makes it understandable for the, for the general public. Uh, and, and it's worked really well. So kudos to Michigan on that. So the post sacket world, so what's next for Michigan? So Michigan no longer has federal strong federal program to support its wetland protection efforts. Because of that, I would expect significant attacks on wetland protection with legislative changes and through strong lobbying efforts from interest groups. And we've seen this even with the strong federal uh, program over the last 25 years or so that I've been in this business, there's been at least six major changes major potential changes to wetland protection in Michigan. Pretty much all of them shut down because of the work of the Watershed Council and, and other environmental groups and EGLE, but mainly because EPA threatened to take away our 404 authority. And that is such an advantage for Michigan that the legislature backed off on each of those. We don't expect that currently, but legislation changes, lobbying groups have a lot of push, the agricultural groups really have pushed reduced wetland protection. And, uh, and I expect that will continue. And if the legislative legislature uh, changes as it will over time, I expect that you will see a reduction of wetland protection. Maybe at some point you'll see an increase of wetland protection. And, and uh, one thing I know that we'd like to see is vernal pool protection uh, increased. So maybe we'll see that at some point, but it will ebb and flow and, and it probably will ebb and flow more than it ever had has in the past because of that loss of federal, uh, strong federal program. So significant regulatory gap, gaps in other states, uh, especially nationally. 
and that's happening. Uh, Ohio's trying to hire some people to take over um, or, or expand their wetland program, specifically uh, like the slide I showed you, coastal wetland protections. Ohio, most of the Ohio's coastal wetlands are bermed for water control purposes, waterfall, uh, for waterfowl management. Those may not be regulated anymore by the federal government. That was a surprise to Ohio. They're trying to figure that out. Uh, Washington State is also trying to significantly add people. Uh, they their their statutes were relied on the federal government uh, to do some of the regulatory authority, take some of the regulatory authority in the state. Now that that's gone, the state of Washington is really struggling to to get their legislation updated to these changes. And then. Uh, as I get close to the end here, I wanted to talk about the Chevron decision. Some of you guys may be aware of the Chevron decision. It was just argued in the U.S. Supreme Court, and the decision is expected soon, probably uh, by the end of the term, for sure by the end of the term, so probably around June. The Chevron decision is a legal te test set forth by the Supreme Court to determine when the court should defer to the agency's answer or interpretation. It was defined nearly 40 years ago in Chevron versus Natural Resource Defense Council. Basically, what that says is the court should rely on the agency as experts. They have, they are the experts. They have the expertise. They should rely on that. Uh, the, the, it is most likely the Supreme Court will throw that out in the, in the upcoming decision. And the, the interpretation that the agencies have made, and, and just, just for instance, um, how much, uh, I don't know, sounds like there was a webinar on PFAS. How much PFAS should be in the water? Uh, the agents, we rely on the agency, we rely on EPA um, or FDA to tell us what should be in the water, what should be in our food. The, removing this decision and the agency's ability would, re, would turn that over to the courts. Uh, and as we've seen with the Sackett decision, the courts, are not reliable in terms of making scientific decisions. And, and that's that's pretty scary. So what do we do about this? Uh, more scientific research needs to be done. Most likely the courts will rely on, on hopefully rely on research uh, that, that will support the agency rules and the agencies write their rules based on solely on this, the research, but we got a lot more work to do. There's a lot of stuff we don't know. And so that that's very challenging. Uh, more thorough legislation. So elect, elected officials need to write more detailed um, le legislation, more detailed statutes. That gets very challenging if you've you've been in the sausage sausage making factory in terms of writing legislation. You got a lot of influence from lobbyists, a lot of influence from the agencies, a lot of uh, other influences, and and writing specific scientific standards has been left up to the agencies for a reason. It just doesn't work well in the legislative process, but but the legislature may be forced to to try to take that on. Um, uh, the courts may look at the stated intent of the statutes. For instance, the Clean Water Act to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of nation's waters was not mentioned once in the Sackett decision. If they had looked at that, I don't know how they could have came up with the decision they came up with. So the cases that are in front of the, the Supreme Court regarding Chevron right now is the Loper Bright Enterprises and the Relentless uh, Inc. Uh, two herring fishing uh, cases that they, they just heard. If you want to find more about it, follow it, check it out. It should be, like I said, a decision should be by, um, by June. We don't know what they're going to say. The thought is they're going to significantly reduce Chevron, if not totally eliminate it. Okay, so can the Clean Water Act be saved? Maybe here's the positive of all of that. Um, it can be. Uh, and I think they left, the Supreme Court left that open in the Sackett decision that Congress could further clarify the waters of the U.S. to include wetlands, tributaries, intermittent and ephemeral waters um, with that stated goal, again, to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrities of the nation's water. Um, so there, in terms of the second decision, there's no recognition of science of the interconnectedness of the waters and the importance to maintaining the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. It just is not going to do that. We, the waters are not going to be protected by the federal government, and, and therefore the purpose of the Clean Water Act not met with uh, this ruling. So with that, 
I appreciate it. And um, I can take questions or we can have a discussion. All right, now I'm unmuted. Uh, thank you so much, Todd. It's an incredible amount of information. Um, I can't thank you enough for being here. So um, I'll run through some of these questions. And um, Jennifer McKay, who is uh, the Watershed Council Policy Director, is tuning in. So you might see her pop on if I struggle with a question, um, as I am not a policy mm -hmm. director. So I'm going to do my best with these questions. All right. So our first uh, question, um, it was asked early on. So you may have given some hints to this, but um, this person is really concerned about the destruction of freshwater areas such as vernal pools. Mm -hmm. Salamanders breed. Uh, how do we protect these vulnerable waters and in so doing protect biodiversity? Yeah, yeah, I did mention that it's currently they're not protected if they're smaller than five acres or less than five or more than 500 feet from another waterway. And so therefore vernal pools in particular, they're, they're small pools in the landscape, typically seasonal, um, very common in, in, in southern Michigan. They are not protected under uh, any of the statutes currently, unless there's a local wetland ordinance. So in some communities, they are they can protect those wetlands. But in terms of state and federal regulation, it's not there yet. Uh, a lot of push and a lot of discussion on the state side to try to add vertical pools or uh, take that five acre limit down to something smaller to protect those areas. But currently, uh, in the majority of the state, vertical pools are not regulated. All right. Um, how does the recent and frequently controversial movement to remove dams relate to the Clean Water Act? So dams typically are in rivers. And, and for the most part, if, if permanently flowing rivers are going to be main, maintain regulation. So they would need Clean Water Act permits. Dams cause a lot of issues with water quality. Uh, in terms of warming the water, reduced dissolved oxygen, um, modifying the movement of sediment as part of natural river systems. And so therefore, typically the government agencies have been supportive of dam removals. And although they will require permits, I, I do expect that they'll continue to support dam removals uh, when, when, when possible and when not, when uh, I get in consideration of societal impacts such as they're not going to remove large dams typically where there's you know lots of people and there's a recreational lake or something like that but when they can remove them I think you're going to see them removed especially if they're a high hazard dam that could cause significant loss of property or life all right sorry about the dog barking in the background that's us <laughs> I didn't um, hear it. so where um where does the idea of traditionally navigable waters come from? And why do laws not instead focus on waters that are used for drinking? Ah, okay. This this gets into the policy wonk world, but basically it's been, it was established in the late 1800s as I think first cited in, um, and maybe not first, but cited in the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899. And it is what based where where the federal government has authority over anything under the Constitution. So under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, the federal government has to protect commerce. And to protect that, there was a determination that the protection of navigation was important. And so therefore, the Constitution protected navigable waters. So that's where it comes from. You can get, you could do a webinar just on that, I think, but that's where it comes from. We'll save that for your next webinar then. All right, all right. Um, this question, I, I hope it, this makes a little sense to you. Um, what is defined by continuously connected water or what is meant when you can follow a stream to the Great Lakes slash regulated water? Does this mean wade float the whole way? No, I don't think it does. It's a good question though. Um, I think I think the river channels of relatively permanent streams or lakes uh, are going to be continue to be regulated. It's when you get beyond the banks, you know, those wet those big wetlands up in the up, upper watersheds that feed into a river channel. The river channel is regulated for sure. Those big wetlands outside of the river channel may not 
be regulated anymore. But I believe the Clean Water Act will allow you to go as far as you can, as long as you're walking in the water. I believe that even this decision will regulate those waters. It's, it's the wetlands adjacent to those that are not going to be covered. Or if those water bodies dry up, if they're ephemeral or seasonal streams, uh, which is a lot of our streams and, and even more in the West, um, those would not be regulated from what I can tell currently. And I think this refers back to something you were talking about in your presentation. Um, was the road built before the wetland was considered waters of the United States? Could entities intentionally fragment waters of the United States wetlands in this way to allow development on them? Yes, to both of them. Yeah, yeah, that, that, I think the road was built prior to the regulation. Um, but that wetland's still connected. It's, there's still water flow underneath um, and through the culverts and bridges. And the, and and um, yes to the second one, which I forget what it was, was but. Um, Kala already scrubbed it off my screen. Okay. And I think it was, yeah. um, could entities uh, intentionally do that in order to oh, be yeah. involved on that? Yeah, I think so. Based on the reading of this statute, yeah. You could fill in a, uh, build a berm across the wetland and that wetland would no longer be regulated under the Clean Water Act. That's not true in Michigan, to be clear, but under the Clean Water Act. Yeah, I think that's where the, the majority of the justices were going. And that's that's part of what Kavanaugh's problem was. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. Okay. Um, do, you, do you know, Todd, if um, Wisconsin and Minnesota are moving quickly to strengthen their state regulations of wetlands in response to Sackett? Really good question. Minnesota has a very strong program uh, and is, has just in the establishment of the program over the years, really severed their interaction with the federal government. They let the federal government do what they want. They do what they want. So that actually doesn't impact them at all. So, and that's the only state that I know that that's the case. Um, Wisconsin has a really strong program too, but they've got some holes they got to fill. I don't know how much is happening over there, but they've got a pretty good program. The other, the other Great Lake states are are more challenging. Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, um, even Pennsylvania are are they've they've got some significant gaps at this point. Okay. Um, how about Canada? How do they compare in their water water and wetland protection? That's beyond me at this point. Sorry, that's I don't know. I don't know. That's the Canadians' problem. Yeah. Well, it's our problem too, but I don't. It's a great question. I, I am not familiar with theirs. Okay. Um, that looks like it's coming from our board member, Bob. So maybe, Bob, we can follow up with you separately. Um, Jennifer might have a little bit of input for you there. Um, we've only got a couple questions left, so I think we can fit everyone in. Um, why did Michigan go for assumption of wetlands program year, years ago, and why didn't more states? Really good question. So Michigan did it because uh, somebody what really – made some really good decisions, you know. Um, they, Michigan saw that this was our ability to have more control over our resources. I guess, hence, hence, hence Sackett, I guess, to a point, because uh, we set up our program so that the state of Michigan would have significant say over their water resources, their wetlands, uh, and their in the lakes and streams. And that, and, and that's true, that's what happened, as we, um, 90% of the permits that, that go through the Eagle are only the state's involvement. Now you got about five to 10% where the EPA still gets involved. So the EPA didn't, I mean, it's not a total, we have total authority. EPA oversees our program and they get involved in about five to 10% of the projects. <clears throat> so that was really the main cause. Why other states didn't do it is that benefit Michigan felt was worth paying for. So Michigan's paying somewhere between 10 to $15 million for their entire um, natural resource program, not just wetlands, Great Lakes, in the lakes and streams. Uh, and, and as you guys know, they've got staff all over the state. They're, they're very well staffed and it costs a lot of money. Other states didn't want to put that money in when the federal government would just pay for it and do it, do it for them. And so they're, they're hurting now for sure. Yeah. Uh, this is asking a lot of you, but what's the bottom line result for wetlands protection and for land development activities in Michigan versus other states without their own program? What's the real world effect? 
as long as Michigan maintains the the statutes that we have, there's no effect. Um, I don't believe that's going to be the case. Jennifer may disagree with me, um, but I think it's going to be a fight. And I think if we get a, a Republican dominated um, House and Senate and, and governor, which we will at some point again, and it'll again ebb and flow back and forth. Um, the, the, the statute modifications that we've seen over the last 25 years that have not passed will be brought back to the table. And that will deregulate wetlands, uh, like the five acre rule may go away, like agricultural activities may be allowed to do whatever they want, which has been an argument from Farm Bureau for years. Um, you know, that, that those protections have protected a lot of wetlands that would go away in that, that regard. Um, you've got a big push by, by uh, developers as well, that they, they would like to be able to fill more wetlands in certain areas. Um, as you guys may be aware, in Southeast Michigan, there's not a lot of good upland properties left. So they're, they're, the developers are struggling down there to build more um, developments, really, if that's residential or industrial or commercial. Uh, most of the properties have wetlands on them. And they, they would like to weaken some of those laws or make it easier to get permits. We do have a very challenging permitting system right now. And uh, Eagle does does really quite a job to protect wetlands and, and reduce impacts and, and to re require mitigation for that. I would expect all that to be visited revisited now that we don't have a strong federal program backing us up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hop on... Since Todd said I he I was going to disagree with him, I'm disagree with him. Um, Good. Good. <laughs> um, so for the last uh, forty years that the Watershed Council has been in existence, we have been the leader in wetland protection in the state of Michigan, and we have been defending uh, the. Wetland Protection Act. It has been in existence since, well, the day I was born. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, we will continue to do so. And I think the Watershed Council is in a very good position to continue to fight for those regulations. And I think the industry, the realtors, the builders know that Michigan has a really good program that works for them and that they will continue to work with us um, to maintain a strong program in Michigan. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for thanks for popping on there. It was mostly an agreement. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Uh, just a couple more quick questions. Uh, Todd, do you know if there's a, a, a cri why they chose five acres as a criteria and not one or 10? No. Just arbitrary. No. Arbitrary. <laughs> um, yeah, just, just determined to be enough of a public resource. Well, you know, enough wildlife habitat or flood storage or whatever. That was just a, a number that was, it was significant enough. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, how can Michigan take on the actions of surrounding states to prevent their harm from harming our state waterways? Oh, good question. I mean, it's a great question. Uh, and it's, it is working with the federal partners and those states. And so Eagle has a pretty strong relationship with EPA and the other states in the, in the Midwest and working with them. Um, I know Eagle does a lot of outreach on our program because a lot of states are interested in, in the success of, of Michigan's program. And so that just continuing to work with them and, and hopefully help them get to that point where they can protect those areas, especially when it impacts the Great Lakes. Yeah. We have one last question for you before we send you off um, from Tom Darton. He's on our board as well. Uh, he sees a disconnect between eagle regulations of lake and stream shores and township zoning of shoreline protection. It seems like it should be a blended process. Do you have any comments on that? No, I don't know if I do. I think I'm thinking what comes to mind quickly is the um, Natural Rivers Program, which which does have that blended uh, local zoning involvement. Eagle does not have that with their in the lakes and streams program. I, I will say that I've been extremely impressed with the advancements at Eagle in terms of shoreline protection regulations 
uh, reducing the amount of hard armoring of shorelines that has been occurring. They've taken some huge steps that I, I wouldn't have thought was possible 10 years ago. So I've been impressed with Eagle in that regard, but they don't work with the locals. It's a good question. And, and you do have a little bit of an example with the Natural Rivers Program and the, how they interact with the locals, but that doesn't occur at Eagle currently in regards to um, at least the review of shoreline protection projects. Okay, well, thank you. All right, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen really quickly. I'm not sure if it came through. Hoping it did. Yeah, I see it. All right. Well, Todd, um, you know, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and gifting us, you know, not only with your time, um, but your extens extensive knowledge base. It's incredible. Um, you're, you are a really incredible resource for our community. We can't thank you enough. Um, uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I hope you can join us for the next session we have coming up. Um, another uh, interesting topic that we, we'd love to chat about. Uh, February 22nd on climate change, a global issue with um, local impact. So we'll be talking about how it's impacting us locally with Brian Burroughs. Uh, and then the next one in March is all about beavers, their impact on our ecosystems, and why you should give a damn with Jeremy Wood. Uh, so please put those on your calendars for next time. Um, and of course, uh, we, we can never get by without our friends. So if you're looking for volunteer opportunities, um, please reach out to us here. We always have um, volunteer opportunities, anything from stuffing envelopes to getting out in the water um, and collecting samples for our monitoring um, program. So please uh, reach out if you're interested in volunteering. And lastly, um, no, nothing is, is done without our members. So uh, thank you all of you in attendance who are members today. Thank you so much. And if you're not, we ask you to consider joining our efforts um, by becoming a member today. You can do that online or by giving us a call. Um, thank you again, Todd. I Like I said, I really appreciate your time and your knowledge. I can't thank you enough. Um, and I'm sure we'll be chatting again soon. Sounds great. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. And just a reminder, there's a, a brief survey um, after we close out. So if you have a moment to fill that out, we'd appreciate it. Thanks so much. And thank you again, Todd. Take care.